Tush, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, looking forward to hearing you talk about your TR250 and what you've been doing to it recently. And um, this is our first time on Zoom, so bear with us in case there are any, a few technical issues here and there. But hopefully this will work okay. And, uh, and I'll try and mute people as well as they join so that we can just hear Tush speaking. So Tush, thank you again, and I'm going to hand over to you. Over to you, my friend. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, hopefully, everybody's doing uh, well tonight in the, uh, the current environment. I'm happy to be here on this uh, initial Zoom meeting. Hopefully, it goes well and we don't have too many uh, technical issues. Um, I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up. I can look at the view over here on my iPad yes. if you guys can hear me. Okay, we can I can see fine. some yep. thumbs in here. Okay, good. So uh, I'm going to flip the camera back and forth now and now and again, so you can see what I'm uh, what I'm looking at in particular. So I'm going to flip the camera now. Hopefully you'll get a different view here. So I'm not sure if there will be any lag during this, but uh, I've got a little uh, show and table uh, show and tell table set up to uh, walk through, and we'll get to that in just a second. So in order to stay a little bit uh, organized, I've got a little bit uh, of a uh, little cheat sheet over here for us to sort of walk through. There's six main points that I want to expand upon and I've got them expanded sort of on this side and I'll go through those points as we uh, get into this discussion. Um, anybody who's interested in seeing the current state of my project, let me just step back here in the garage a little bit. So uh, obviously the 68 TR250 project, this has been ongoing for, I think this is the third year People were making jokes of my T minus schedule that I had up before that I, <laughs> I think I wanted to get this done in about 180 days, but I think I've surpassed that so far by about 200 days. Anyway, it's, uh, it's coming together. I can sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel as far as the body work is concerned. Uh, it does have some uh, little custom touches here and there. Wayne McGill, you might uh, recognize those off a uh, Herald grill that uh, I bought from you some time ago. They're looking pretty good in there. So uh, one little uh, modification to the car. So yeah, so it's, uh, it's well on its way anyway to getting uh, into paint and hopefully that will be in the next uh, few weeks. All right, enough about the uh, car. We can answer questions, anything generally TR related, I can uh, answer questions on towards the end of the chat. If you guys wanna throw some comments down in the chat box, we can answer questions later. But let's start the uh, sort of restoration or how I restore cars and how I get to the, uh, the final paint stage. So. If I look at my, uh, my sheet here, and I, hopefully everybody can see that okay. So point number one is uh, to bare metal. So we'll talk a little bit about stripping to bare metal. So I'll talk on this form here about stripping to bare metal and we'll strip, switch over to the cheat sheet here and I'll go through the individual points here. So four different ways, actually five different ways to strip a vehicle. That is really the first step in doing a full body off uh, restoration or a full restoration of a, any TR basically, a Spitfire, GT6, whatever. The best thing to do if you're doing a full restoration is to get down to uh, bare metal. And on this case with this car, when I got down to metal, bare metal, it was an absolute nightmare. This car actually didn't look that bad with the paint on. And that's when I had put that together, that T minus schedule. But that changed pretty quickly once I got the paint off and had a look at the panels beneath this car. It had some significant work on it done on it by the previous owners over who knows how many years. Anyway, so stripping, cleaning discs is the first way you can actually strip the car down to bare metal. And uh, by what I mean by that is uh, there's a couple different uh, ways you can do that. Uh, generally, you can use uh, something like a flap disc, like an 80 grit uh, flap disc to remove the paint uh, and primer. You could use something like, uh, this is my preferred way if I'm doing a strip with the angle grinder. This is a fiber disc made by 3M. This uh, tends to work pretty well to remove the paint without scoring the metal. The thing with flap discs is if you happen to be using a flap disc and you tilt it on a bit of an angle, it can actually put little grooves in the metal that can be difficult to get out. If you don't have an angle grinder, or you're doing a smaller location, you can always get something like this, which is a drill attachment to which you can stick a sticky back pad to, grinding attachment. There's other different ways. There's another uh, different pad system, again, with a four and a half inch angle grinder attachment to it. Uh, again, using uh, 80 grit uh, pads to get down to bare metal. Um, you can also do things like wire brushes. So I've got an assortment of wire brushes here, some that are drill mounted, some that are grinder mounted, some are more aggressive, some are less aggressive. 
I've also got uh, angle grinder uh, mounts uh, as well for, for uh, wire brushes. So that tends to work pretty well to uh, strip off paint in really tight areas. You're going to see a number of DA uh, sanders over here where you can attach sticky discs to as well. So if you don't want to go the angle grinder route, you can always go to a DA uh, sander, uh, dual action sander to be able to get down to, uh, to bare metal. So those are just some tools and some tips on how to get down to bare metal, just using sort of the mechanical uh, fashion. Point number B is uh, media blasting. And by that, I mean a combination possibly of glass, soda, or walnut shells. A long time ago, we made a visit to uh, the Soda Pro in Mississauga with the club. And at that point in time, I was working on my 60 TR3A project. And I actually brought the nose of the car to use as a demo piece. So I've had some panels on previous cars soda blasted and that worked out pretty well. Let me just say there's uh, pros and cons uh, in uh, media blasting. Um, if you're talking about soda, I guess one of the cons with soda is that you need to make sure that you neutralize everything before you continue on with your primer and paint steps. That's one thing about soda blasting. One thing about media blasting is you also have to be very careful of uh, damaging your panels. If you're particularly if you're looking at blasting your exterior panels, which I don't necessarily recommend doing unless it is something like soda blasting or something like walnut shells that's not going to introduce a lot of heat to your panels. I generally reserve sandblasting for the body tub alone. I don't uh, necessarily like to do the exterior panels. So in this case with this TR250 project, I had this taken up to a, a sandblaster uh, near Aurelia and I had the body tub blasted with glass, a combination of glass and sand. So the combination of glass and sand works really well. It puts a good etch on the metal. Again, you got to be careful with your pressures when you're blasting. Um, I leave that generally up to the professionals. I have tried doing it in my garage here at home, if you can believe that. It makes a tremendous amount of mess and dust that uh, will quickly make you rethink doing it in the garage. So I'd suggest that you take it, if you're going to do a whole body tub, take it up to a, a professional to do it. Just as far as cost is concerned, it cost me about $400 to get the TR250 body tub done, which wasn't too bad considering um, the cost of materials. Uh, obviously, it's just sand. But if you're buying uh, sand or you're buying glass to do blasting, it's about $10 to $12 for a 50-pound you know, 50, uh, 50, uh, bag, and they can go through that pretty quickly. So that cost adds up significantly. The problem with uh, media blasting, obviously, is you get uh, a lot of sand or a lot of media in different crevices within the car. So if you're working on uh, a car or, uh, you know, on a sort of a rotisserie system or trying to get to the bottom of the car, you're going to get a lot of uh, sand sort of uh, floating back and forth from the creases of your panels. So if you are, for example, trying to rotate a car to paint it uh, or primer it, you might introduce a lot of uh, media that you never found originally when you did your, uh, you know, your final cleaning. Uh, one of the other uh, ways to do this is a chemical strip. And by a chemical strip, I'm talking about something like a automotive stripper or an aircraft type stripper. So brush on. A layer uh, stick to uh, get the chemical to work a little faster. Um, the strippers today are not as good as the strippers used to be. Uh, they have a lot less harsh chemicals. They're more economically friendly, if you can call them that. So it takes a lot more time and effort to actually use strippers. And trust me, the, the, prim the primer that they used on these old Triumphs was pretty stout. So you probably have to do, depending on how many layers of paint you have in your car, you could possibly do three to four coatings of stripper to get all of the paint off the panels. Hmm. Again, with, uh, with chemical stripping, there's some concern about uh, getting a uh, chemical stripper into little nooks and crannies in the car. And if you don't get that out or neutralize that, that's going to obviously affect your paint job in the end. That leads me into uh, point D, which is acid dipping. So there are uh, places like Ready Strip, for example, where you can take your car and you can have your full car dipped. Again, uh, I guess the only con to that is that dipping solution can get trapped in your panels and your, in your seams, basically. And then it's, if you can't get it out of there, then that can sort of ruin your paint over a period of time, too. The last thing I have on the list is a combination. And by a combination, as generally what I do, is I try to strip as much as I can with the cleaning disc, with wire brushes. And I'm saying uh, combination because what I generally do is I strip as much as I can, 
And then I have like little sandblasters, little handheld sandblasters. For example, this gun here, which is a Princess Auto Special, I think it's about 20 bucks. These work remarkably well on seams and areas where there's rush that's hard to get, uh, you know, there are grinding disc in there or a wire brush. Those work really well. I've also been known to use a bucket type blaster just outside the door here. My neighbors love me, um, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, you can actually see a bunch of blasting media out of here where I've just brought parts out here and just done, you know, small parts uh, just on my little side door here. So that's what I tend to do as far as uh, exterior panels is a combination of uh, stripping with uh, mechanical uh, means and then finishing corners, edges, tight areas with that little handheld sandblaster. All right, so hopefully I've covered that. One more thing, just when we talk about media blasting, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done before you bring the car to a media blaster. So if you're doing the body tub, for example, these cars are famous for having a ton of undercoating on them. So before you take it to the blaster, you actually need to put the effort in to, to remove all of the undercoating and generally seam sealer as well, as a lot of uh, undercoating is rubberized and that blasting media will just bounce right off of it. So that's kind of an added step that you need to do. Not the, I mean, you pretty much have to take it off anyway. But if you're prepping a car to take it to the blaster, you really need to make sure that you go to the effort to take that undercoating off the bottom. The best way that I've found to do that, and there's a bunch of different ways from anything from dry ice I've heard, never tried it. Generally what I do is uh, I use a uh, heat gun and a scraper. It's a long, arduous process, but uh, it's actually, you know, it's actually kind of comforting when you're in a cold garage, at, you know, five degrees, that heat gun kind of warms you up nicely. So. I don't suggest doing it on a day like today, but in the winter, it's not too bad. It's actually kind of satisfying in the end to see the, uh, the nice clean panels or hopefully nice clean panels underneath and not, uh, you know, a botched uh, brazed welding job. All right, let's go on to number two. So number two, once we get the, uh, the body uh, stripped down to bare metal, we're then going to start repairing body damage. You'll see here, I've got a little arrow. I have got applying primer or repairing body damage. And I'll talk about this little arrow up and down. Some guys, once they get the, uh, the body blasted, their first step is to, regardless of whether the body needs repair or not, they like to get it into epoxy primer, just so it doesn't flash rust. We don't have as much problems here uh, you know, with flash rusting, but somewhere down the south, southern US, for example, if you can imagine doing a, a car in Florida where there's high humidity and a lot of rain, you can imagine that the metal will rust pretty quickly. So people tend to get their cars into epoxy primer very quickly. I tend to like to not do that right away. I tend to like to do my welding repairs. So, so I've got point number here, do my welding repairs after I've got the uh, body stripped down to bare metal. Uh, for my welder, I'll just show you what I've got quickly here. It's a relatively small welder and I bought it intentionally for the fact that it runs off a of regular household current. It's an easy MIG 140 by Lincoln. It does pretty much everything that I want to do on this car and more. Whether it's bodywork or framework, this uh, little machine does enough of everything that, uh, that it, it works actually perfect. I don't need anything larger. I am welding with a bottle of gas on it, which makes the welds much cleaner. I use a, a combination of, uh, it's called C25, so a uh, combination of oxygen and argon uh, as my welding gas. Um, I also tend to use a spot welder quite a bit. So this will prevent you from having to go to the gym. These things are extremely heavy. This one's actually got a built-in timer, so it's quite a nice unit, but it's extremely heavy. I've actually seen guys mount them on their engine hoist with uh, wires that are so heavy to hold for an extended period of time. And as you get older, it gets even harder and harder to hold that up. So uh, welding repairs need to be done. Uh, I have uh, generally a you know, pretty good selection of metal hanging around the garage. On these cars, it's 18-gauge uh, metal for the body, 16-gauge for the frame, and there's a few other areas where it's a little bit, uh, a little bit thicker, like the bump stops for the suspension on the rear, they're about 13-gauge, but for the most part, it's about 18-gauge uh, metal that you can buy, um, so that's not an issue. Um, after you do your welding, there may be areas you know, obviously you can do full panel repairs like floors or sills. This car has actually had new sills put into it. It didn't need new floors this car, fortunately. My TR3, on the other hand, needed new floors and pretty extensive work as well. I always seem to pick the good cars. I pick the Canadian cars, the ones that have been driven all the way through the winter. 
just give myself a bit of a challenge. But um, hammer and dolling is next. So anything you find as far as small dents are concerned, uh, I've got a hammer and dolly set here that uh, basically comes in handy. So this is just a really cheap uh, hammer and dolly set. I think it's probably a Canadian tire or an Eastwood set. So that's kind of an essential thing to have. I also find this, uh, this kind of set here uh, to be handy. It's a, it's a chisel set, but it's got a bunch of different type interchangeable tips on it. So everything from like a, like a, a round head to a, a flat head, this can work really well to do some body work. So definitely need a good uh, hammer and dolly set and a bunch of different hammers. Um, so you need to go through and do your hammer and dolly work. Obviously, if you have a slide hammer, sometimes that might be required. I also put here stinger, so that's a stud welder. I don't have a stud welder in my uh, arsenal, but I have friends that have one and they work particularly well to get large dents out, particularly when there's no access from behind the panel. So stud welders can be a really uh, good part of uh, equipment to own in a uh, full restoration. Let me just take a sip of my Coke here. When I take a sip of my Coke, everybody's got to take a sip of their Coke or beer. All right. After you do your hammer and dolly and get the metal as good as you can, we then start to get into the body filler. And I generally use a combination of poly and fiberglass. So as far as products that I use are here, I'm, uh, I particularly like the Evercoat Ranger products. Um, it seems to really sand very well, applies very well and sands very well. As far as um, fiberglass, short strand fiberglass filler, just got a Bondo brand here from Canadian Tire or a Pro, brand, a Pro Series brand seems to work okay. Um, Evercoat does make a, um, a, brand, uh, a sort of a similar product. I think it's called Tiger Hair or Kitty Hair. Um, generally what I do as far as uh, when I use the fiberglass filler, I use that over my welds. It's a little bit more waterproof than actual polyester uh, filler. So I'll generally use a fiberglass filler over my first uh, swipe of uh, filler over a weld, and then I'll overcoat that with the regular polyester primer. You also see I've got a glazing or a spot putty. So this is for any pinholes that occur in the uh, regular filler. It's just a, like a thinner filler, already pre-mixed. So that's really kind of your final uh, use um, over top of regular body filler after everything's sanded. If you've got a few little pinholes, you can actually use the glazing or spot putty. It actually comes in tubes. It's called icing as well. Kind of looks like icing that you get on like a, a cinnamon roll. Um, it's a very thin uh, style Bondo. Okay, so that's basically what I do as far as getting the body ready to do, to go to the next stage. And remember we were talking about doing epoxy first or epoxy second. So I'm sort of the type of guy that likes to do most as much as body work as I can before I go to the next step, which is doing the uh, poly or the um, epoxy primer. In this case, there are certain areas that I knew I wasn't going to be working on. I went ahead and I actually did the uh, epoxy primer, uh, like the floors, for example, I knew I wasn't going to be doing any work on. So I went ahead and did those so they wouldn't rust for the rest of it. Um, and there's two schools of thought here. <clears throat> when you spray, epoxy primer, um, you can either spray it over top of your bodywork or you can do bodywork on top of it. So I'm a kind of a little bit old school. I prefer to actually still do my bodywork direct to metal and then overcoat it with epoxy. But modern guys will tell you, do your epoxy first, then do your bodywork over top of it, of course, with the appropriate scratch. There is another type of primer you can put on is your base primer, and uh, that would be self-etching primer. So Epoxy primer uh, depends on a mechanical scratch. So this is uh, just a couple of different brands that I can get locally of epoxy primer. This one's in black, this one's in gray. Um, I tend to like the black, uh, particularly when I'm gonna go with a, uh, this is gonna be a royal blue car. So epoxy primer can also be used as a sealer coat. So the intent is that when I get to a point when I'm gonna do sealer on this car, I can use the same primer. So that's why I have black epoxy for this car. It needs a catalyst that we have here. Um, this is actually mixed one-to-one, -one, this type of uh, epoxy. There are other epoxies on the market. I actually have Raptor lined the bottom of this car. This is an actual Raptor liner epoxy to below the uh, Raptor liner. Raptor liner is like a uh, truck bed liner, and you can see it here, it's this black coating. Actually, it can be tinted body color if you wanted to. So that's a, that's a good product that I highly recommend. 
So getting back to the other choice of primer. So here we have a self etching primer. Self etching also depends on a bit of a mechanical scratch, but it also uses a chemical, sort of an acid to etch into the metal. So the problem with uh, self etching primer I find, and that's why I prefer to use epoxy primer, is you cannot do bodywork uh, under self etching primer, nor can you do bodywork over self etching primer. So it's gotta be clean, direct metal when you're doing your bodywork and you're not supposed to overcoat your Bondo with self etching primer. So generally I try to stick to using the epoxy primer and that's my sort of methodology when I'm doing that. So after you get through the epoxy primer stage and you've got your body filler done and you've got your body filler blocked out to a point where you're ready to add a top coat on top of that. So generally what I do is I do my body work and then the next step I will actually put the epoxy primer over top of my body work. If I've cleaned epoxy off in order to do body work, I'll then recoat where I've prepared the area. In this case, I've done some work over here on this inner fender. I'm gonna recoat this with epoxy primer before I move on to the next step. The next step for me will be a high build urethane primer. And I've got an example of that here. This is just a shop line by PPG. It's a fairly sort of a cheaper end of the primer. It's not sort of, let's, let's call it a medium price primer, but it's cheap for PPG. Let's just talk about that. You have a choice basically of using a urethane primer. So this is a high build 2K primer. Or if your body work is suspect, or maybe you're just a beginner, there's also a polyester primer. So basically polyester primer is a sprayable Bondo. I find with um, find that a block so when you're sanding it down, it's primer. So the good thing with polyester primer, it's got very, very good hiding qualities. So in this particular Dave, Dave, hang on. So I've got an assortment of blocks here. So the next step after applying either a polyester or a urethane primer is to block it down. So um, you're going to want to block that uh, primer down to a minimum of, I would say 600 grit. It depends on whether you're doing a solid color or whether you're doing a metallic color. If you're doing metallic, you need to block it down to a higher grade. So uh, necessity, uh, sanding blocks. I generally do most of my hand, uh, sanding by hand. I'm not really a professional. So um, I find that I get into trouble with uh, machines like this, like a, a straight line sander um, can be, uh, you can take off a lot of material at once. So I generally tend to hand block things down still. Um, so there's different uh, approaches to uh, sanding. You could either sand on a block. I can go back to my uh, DA sanders here. You can actually use the DA sanders to sand down your body filler as well. There are different sizes of DAs. Obviously a larger one gets you a sort of a flatter, finer finish. So everything from a six inch down to a four inch DA. And of course you'll need the appropriate sandpaper for that. Generally what I do is uh, if I'm blocking things out, I'll start with probably about 180 to, to 220 grit as my first uh, blocking step. And then, like I said, for a solid color, like I will have on a TR6, I'll move up to something like a 600 grit wet um, to do my final sanding, uh, final block sanding on primer before going to my color coat. I do have here as well, a uh, seam sealer. So that's another step in the process. Generally what you do is you're gonna add your seam sealer after you add your primer coat. I've got a couple different types of sealer here. This is just a uh, sort of a caulking gun style of seam sealer. There are brushable styles. There's also a strip caulk. If you've got uh, very, very large areas that you need to uh, put sealer on, that strip caulk seems to work well. For example, that would be something I would use uh, in the, around the rear tail lights of a TR6, for example, when you're ready to put the body back together. Let's go back to our uh, list here. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, tech sheets as well. So I sort of skipped over a little bit. So let me go. And the important thing is that for each and every one of these products that I'm showing, they all have different specification, different ways to handle, to handle them, different pot lifes, different uh, sanding requirements, for example. So. It's a good idea for every product that you have to make sure you get it. That I have here. 
Um, it actually tells you everything from the activator that you need, what finishes it goes over, what you need to send that to, what gun uh, tip size you need to spray that with. So there's a ton of information here on your uh, technical sheet. So for every product that you get that you're going to be using, you should actually have the appropriate tech sheet for that. That's very, very important. Okay. So going back to sanding. So we've talked about sanding blocks, sanding grits. I already sort of talked about sanding pads. And this is another uh, thing that uh, I, I use quite often. So this is a Scotch-Brite uh, pad. So this is a maroon pad. This is something looks like coming like that. So this is kind of equivalent to about a 300 grit scratch. So if you're doing a internal body tub, for example, and you know the finish doesn't have to be fantastic in here because mostly everything is going to be covered by interior anyway. You want to kind of shortcut a little bit and not use sandpaper. Uh, I generally use a maroon pad to, to scuff this down before I get into primer. I'll actually use a gray pad. So the gray pad is about 600 grit, so it's pretty fine. So in that case, I'll use a gray pad to scuff that down before I go to my color coat. It's a little easier doing interior, for example. I would never use the, those uh, sanding scratches. Exterior, I do actual with actual sandpaper and not the scuff pads. Um, but for anywhere that the, the paint is not going to be overly important. So engine bay, trunk, for example, anything that's not going to be like looked at under a magnifying glass, I generally use those uh, scotch bright pads or they come in quite helpful. Okay, back to our board. <clears throat> so we've got our primer blocked and sanded and prepped ready for paint. So now we're on to color coat, color and top coat. So let's go over here. So color coat, generally what's available on the market right now within Canada are low VOC base coats. And I still paint with solvent based paints, but they're all low VOC. There are waterborne paints, which require different uh, equipment setups. I've never tried waterborne systems, but I still use solvent based paints. I do paint a lot with matrix brand because that's the, uh, the brand that my uh, local auto body shop um, has. So that's generally what I'll use as my top coat. Generally what I try to do is I try not to mix brands uh, when I'm doing my, my base coat and my clear coat. There's different options obviously on, on how you can paint the car. You can choose a single stage, for example. You could choose an enamel if you wanted to. I've always chosen a um, base coat, clear coat, because this garage that I paint in is extremely dirty. And that comes from me doing welding, grinding, sandblasting in here. So you can imagine the state of this garage. I clean it out to the best of my ability, but still it's quite a dirty garage. Now, some guys will say, well, why don't you build a booth in here? Well, honestly, I'm just too lazy to do that. It's, it's a lot of work to build a booth. So when I do this garage setup, it's really just a simple garage door shut with some box fans out front, side door open with a sort of a cross draft coming through. And I'll actually spray here, wet the floor down to uh, keep the dust from rising. Sometimes I'll put a screen in, depending on the, the time of year, obviously, I get a lot of bugs and flies, and they particularly like clear coat. <laughs> so uh, that's basically how I do my paint setups in, in the garage. And that's why I paint base coat, clear coat, because generally I'll get a lot of trash in my paint, not having a booth. And it gives me the ability, if I had an extra coat of clear, I can actually sand, sand a lot of that garbage out. And we'll get to the wet, um, the sanding uh, part in just a second, but that's generally why I use a base coat, clear coat system, okay? different reducers. Um, so there's, there's quite a, an art to uh, mixing paint. And uh, you'll see that I have actually a little uh, temperature gauge up here, a humidity gauge. I don't, I don't think the humidity is quite right. So I think it's definitely 90 in here. It feels like 90. But anyway, um, there are different reducers based on the temperature. And it's a bit of like being a bartender when you're painting. You got to figure out your heat, heat and your humidity to figure out what reducer you're going to use. So there are fast, there are medium, and there are slow reducers. So the slow reducer would be for a high temperature. So today I would definitely be shooting with a slow reducer in the paint. If it's cold, middle of winter, uh, 65 degrees or 70 degrees in the garage with my heater on, I can generally uh, you know, use a fast base coat reducer. I have the slow and the fast here because I can make a medium <laughs> if basically I need to. So I'll just combine those in a mixing cup and 
you know, half, half, and uh, you're ready to shoot with medium. There's also things like you can add, uh, like I said, you can make cocktails out. This is a urethane accelerator. So if you need to accelerate these, um, as far as flash time is concerned, you can actually add a urethane accelerator to them. Um, again, the paint I use mixes one to one. So if I'm buying a gallon of sprayable paint, by the time I actually mix that, that gives me two gallons of sprayable material. So um, I did make the mistake on my 60 TR3 by not buying enough paint. And uh, if you go back and look at some of my videos on my YouTube channel, you'll see that I repainted my TR3 because the second time I went to get my paint mixed and I sprayed the doors, it was actually a different color white. So it was more of a beigey white. So I couldn't actually deal with that. So I actually stripped the car down again and repainted the whole thing after I painted it. So always buy enough paint. Even if you think you've got too much paint, it's better to have too much than not enough. So I may not need a gallon of paint to do this car. I'm not spraying the bottom of this car um, because I've already wrapped or lined the bottom of this car, but I'm still going to buy a gallon of paint just to make sure that I have extra paint. So that's one tip is make sure you have enough paint unless you wanna go through the hassle of uh, mismatching paint. All right, clear coats. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of clear coats on the, uh, on the marketplace. This is actually a high solid clear coat. They call it a European style clear coat. This is actually mixed two to one. And again, um, the hardeners for the clear coat are gonna be based on temperature. This is a medium hardener. Um, so again, same sort of idea with uh, the, the base coat reducers. There's gonna be uh, a fast, a slow and a medium for the reducers on that. So tons of different clear coat options on the marketplace. Um, everything from, you know, super high gloss, high solid clear coats to total matte finished clear coats. So lots of things on the market. And like I said, I like to not mix my base coat and clear coat products. So I generally have the same brand. I don't find it's that, uh, you know, to mix products between, you know, Evercoat does a Bondo. They also do a primer. They also do a polyester primer. I don't feel the need at that level to not mix brands, but when I get to the top coat and clear coat, I definitely want to try to keep within the same family. All right. Uh, what else have I got on the list over here? Equipment, guns, filtration, etc., is the next thing. So kind of the expense part. Well, you know, body and paint jobs cost so much. And when rolls of masking tape cost $11. But uh, when you get to the guns, I've got a, just a selection of guns. I've got actually a few more in the, uh, in the cabinet. Everything from very cheap guns. This is a Canadian Tire uh, Craftsman type gun or Mastercraft gun that I would use for something like a primer. Um, these are all HVLP, so high volume, low pressure. They're supposed to use less materials, have less overspray. Um, so generally, uh, there's two types of guns on the market. The older style guns are a siphon feed, so they have the cup on the bottom. I actually don't have anything of those to show you. But the siphon feed were sort of the standard a while ago, but the HVLP is really now the new standard. So now I have HVLP here in order of sort of expensiveness. So obviously the Mastercraft brand being the cheapest, this is a Devil Bisc brand. And generally I'll use this for primer. It's got about a 1.8 tip in it. When you're doing something like uh, a polyester primer or even a high build primer, generally they'll call for a 1.6 to a 1.8 tip. Polyester will even get up to something like a 2.2 tip. So you really have to, again, go back to your tech sheets and, and look for what it asks as far as a tip size. And again, all of your gun settings are gonna be on the tech sheets as well. It's gonna tell you what pressure you need at the gun. Uh, sometimes they'll give you what pressure you need at the cap, for example. Um, I also find, so this is getting into more expensive guns. These are relatively expensive, probably six to $800 range. This is a mini SATA jet. Again, a small HVLP gun, but it's a mini gun to get into tight spaces like the engine bay on the car, for example, or the spare tire compartment on a TR3, for example. I can set this up with a mini cup instead of a full size cup. So there's a mini cup. And we'll talk a bit more about these style cups in a minute. Um, the Mac Daddy of the guns I have is this uh, HVLP gun here uh, from Satajet. This um, is a mini Satajet. This is a full size Satajet 5000 HVLP. Um, this is actually a Morgan edition. So if uh, Glenn is watching, there's a Morgan edition uh, Satajet gun, quite expensive getting into the 800 to $1,000 range, depending on where you shop. 
So um, let's talk about this. Uh, so the standard cups on these are something like this old style cups, but uh, I'm going to recommend, um, so this is called the double bis decups system. So it's really a disposable cup system. So it's got a frame on the outside and it's got disposable cups on the inside and of course a lid. And then the lid goes on top and this actually clips into an adapter on the top of your spray gun. The good thing is those cups are obviously completely disposable so it helps on your cleanup of your gun. But the other good thing is that it allows you to spray upside down. So if there are areas that are difficult to get to on your car, for example, if I'm spray painting this car and I'm not on a rotisserie and I'm trying to get up under the dash, I can actually use that gun and spray upside down. So that's the biggest benefit, I think, of having those cups, the D cups, is the ability to spray upside down. Having a, uh, you know, a, an easier cleanup is quite nice, but really the ability to, sp to spray upside down is quite nice. Okay, so there's a general overview on equipment. So filtration, um, and maybe let's talk a little bit about compressors. So I have a 60 gallon compressor and uh, some of these guns are difficult to run on smaller compressors. I do have one gun, it's called an Eastwood Concourse gun, which is specifically more for a home style use where it requires only I think about six CFM, so volume uh, cubic foot of air per minute. This compressor is rated to 13.4 CFMs at 40 PSI. Um, so that, will, that compressor will drive these guns okay. So there are requirements as far as what CFM you need, not only to run your air guns, but also your air tools as well, but more importantly, your air guns. So compressor setup is important. I've got a number of different compressors. I've still got a, an old compressor in the back there. I use more as an air tank. I killed that compressor a few years ago. I still use the air tank. It's just an extra volume of air. And I've got a smaller compressor here if I don't want to run up the big compressor. You're going to need some filtration um, on your compressors when you're doing paint, painting because obviously there's going to be some humidity in the air. Humidity is also created by your compressor. It runs, can run fairly hot. So you're going to need some filtration systems on your lines. I also have a big desiccant filter here on that I run my um, hoses in and out of. So it's running through the top. Air comes out the bottom. Runs through a desiccant dryer. I also have a refrigerated air dryer over here that I hook up when I'm painting. So here's a refrigerated dryer, for example, that uh, we'll use to get the moisture out of the line. So that's very important. You'll also see on my guns, I have what are called whirlwind um, moisture removers. So these are my final ability to remove moisture out of the lines before it gets into the paint. Okay, those are very important. So filtration is very important uh, to get a good paint job. If you don't have filtration and you get water spitting over your guns, obviously that's going to put craters in your paint and you're not going to be happy with your paint job. So that's another large investment is compressor, guns, and filtration. That's probably the largest investment you're probably going to find. All right, um, let's talk about uh, finishing and correction, okay? Point number six. So let's talk about dirt imperfections. And I already talked about I, I paint in a relatively dirty garage. So I do tend to get quite a few specks of dust in my clear coat. First step you can do is to get rid of some of those is to get what's called a nib file. So these are nib files. There's a fine one and a coarse one. So what you would do is you would actually use these to go across the top of your clear coat and just sort of, sort of file off the nibs that are there. Some people will actually use razor blades and they'll just scratch the uh, surface with a razor blade. But these, uh, these nib files come in quite uh, handy actually to get some of the larger specs out. And you're gonna get them if you're painting in a garage like mine. So then we get down to color sanding and blocking, which is B on my thing here. So you get to go through a whole bunch more sand. If you hadn't sanded enough on your, your prime base coat, you get to do some more sanding. So what I mean by color sanding is you're going to go through a series of grits of sandpaper on a soft block. Uh, usually, uh, and I've got a bunch of different grits here to show you. So generally, uh, low, the 1500 grit per thousand grit, I'm trying to do is you're going to wet sand, you're going to soak your paper and you're going to wet sand on a soft block. And you're going to take out any imperfection in any orange peel, any dust that you have out of the top coating of your clear coat. So you need to go through that step 
Um, obviously, it dulls when you're sanding your clear coat. And as you can imagine, if you've ever done it for the first time, you think you've absolutely ruined your paint job because the entire surface will dull. What you do is you actually, you're going to be wet sanding. So I have this little squeegee here. So as you sand, you use this little rubber squeegee to squeeze away the water. And that will actually show you whether you've sanded the area you know, enough that you've got all the imperfections out so you can move on to the next step. After you finish sanding, then you get to buff. So there's a bunch of different uh, companies out here that do um, finishing compounds. Um, some of them are two-step, some of them are three-step. Probably 3M is uh, probably the most known. I actually use a company called Presta. So step, down, step number one is generally after you've sanded, you wanna use a compound. So this is a fairly coarse compound. So that's your step one in this case. Then they have a step two. This is a finishing polish. And of course, when you use these compounds and polishes, you do different um, pads. So you may start with a wool pad, for example, on the compounding stage. You may, you'll finish with a, well, potentially finish with a foam pad. Pads are generally different colors for different uh, styles of finishes. Uh, anything from black to green to white pads. Again, you'll have to look up what uh, the back of each pad means. Uh, I've got actually a, you probably can't see it up there on top. I've got a cheap Mastercraft kit with a bunch of different colored pads up there. But um, so that's your final step is your, your uh, polishing. So your compounding and polishing is your final step to, uh, to get a mirror like paint job. So that's pretty much an overview of painting a, well, metal working, body working, and finishing a TR. Lots of steps and lots of products involved. No kidding. So, I, I am impressed. I am very impressed, Tush. You've obviously spent a lot of time and effort and money in putting all of this together. So uh, well done. So if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to send a question through the chat line, that's at the bottom, you'll see a, a chat icon. Click onto there and ask your question. But Tush, I have a question for you. Sure. So you're painting your, your TR250 TR in royal blue. That's correct. Um, I had a royal blue TR5 back in Britain, and mm -hmm. I had a, a light blue interior. What are you planning for the interior on this? So fortunately on this car, um, it came actually with a good in – so the, the st I should go back, Dave. So the stock colors for this car are royal blue and black, so black being paint code number 11. So this car actually came with a half decent, fortunately, a half decent uh, interior. So I have nothing to do with the seat. So I've got a black interior with white piping for okay. this car. Um, so that's what we'll be going back in. It was an insurance um, adjustment claim that the previous owner had made. So actually the interior was in pretty good shape on this car. One of the very few things that was in good shape. So <laughs> black interior, royal blue exterior. Ah, and actually I've got the, um, you know, Getting paint mixed with the old Triumph codes can be a little bit, uh, little bit problematic. I've taken codes into uh, paint shops before and said, you know, can I have this mixed up? But it's really difficult unless you get a specialty shop that will actually mix Triumph paints for you. So for the Royal Blue for this car, I've actually tried to match it as close as possible. And I've done, of course, a lot of research on the Internet. And they're saying that uh, this Chrysler DB9, which is called Nightwatch Blue, is very close to the original royal blue color. I've actually sprayed a panel out. It's a little dusty, but I um, took the panel and then I matched it up to a, um, a panel at the, on the front of the car that actually had not been re-sprayed over by the previous owner. And uh, you're not gonna be able to see this very well, but there's sort of the royal blue that this car is gonna be. Again, base coat, clear coat. Oh, okay. so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Do we have any more questions from folks? So uh, just put it in the chat line and uh, we'll ask Tush the question. It doesn't have to be about body work. It could be anything to do with TR3s, TR4s, TR250, 6 or 8. Because <laughs> Tush has them all. Yeah. I'm a sucker for punishment. You can, <laughs> even, ask me, you can even ask me an Alfa Romeo comment or question if you want. Oh. Hello. What happened there? Archie's sharing his screen. Oh. Any, anything good on Archie's screen? <laughs> no, <laughs> just a meeting <laughs> invitation. There we go. Oh. Uh, we have a question from Andrew Grace. Uh, he's asking about wheels. What are you doing for your wheels? 
Hey, Andrew, how you doing? All the way from the UK. Um, so wheels on this car, I haven't really decided what I'm going to do yet. I do have a set of, um, they're called uh, JB uh, wheels that came on my TR3. So they're a kind of a black and a chrome, uh, almost like an aluminum, not really like a brightly polished rim. So those are an option for this car. Um, I'm also kind of partial to uh, Panasports or a Koenig style rim, which I've got on my TR6. Andrew probably wants me to run wires on this, but I'm actually reserving some wires for my, I've got a 59 TR3 project that's going to have wires on it. So I'll have wires on that. So this one is probably going to have some sort of aftermarket, uh, sh you know, fairly shiny, fairly aggressive looking uh, aftermarket aluminum rims on it to go with my nice little uh, rally vents over there. What do you wear for protective equipment when you're painting? Okay, good question. So when I'm painting, uh, generally I just use a good, uh, obviously respirator meant for paint. I knew this question would come up. So obviously uh, in a, a enclosed environment, particularly in the winter, it's not too bad obviously in the, in the summertime when I've got all the doors open. Um, something like an air fed mask is probably a good investment, but a good air fed mask. And what I mean by air fed mask, it's going to be fed by outside air. They can probably run you about a thousand dollars. So that's another expense that you need to uh, consider if you wanted to get uh, into a better filtration system than something to, than just a regular respirator. Okay, got a question from Mike Rhinelander. He says, I have a 76 TR6. It's missing the back set of steering column bushings. I have them to put in. I was wondering the best way to replace them. So what he means by the back set, David, like back set of, oh, steering column bushings. Yes. Yep. So I thought he was talking suspension bushing. So generally what, uh, what I try to do is I use a uh, small PVC pipe um, that matches the uh, outside, sorry, basically the inside diameter of the shaft. I use the PCP pipe to push the bushings down until the little nubs lock into the uh, areas on the column. Okay, good enough. Um, I just want to mention Andrew as well. Andrew is on from the UK and it's, um, Gosh, it's past your bedtime, Andrew. Shouldn't yeah. you be in bed by now? My goodness me. He's a keener. He is a keener. That's right. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh -huh. Okay. Any more questions? Nothing's come up so far. If you have a question, just put it in our chat line and uh, Tush will answer it. He knows everything. <laughs> Not so sure about that. But, oh, uh... well, well you, you told me you did. <laughs> Well, if I don't know the answer, Dave, I'll just make something up. <laughs> of course you will. <laughs> Is your neighbor's pool finished yet? Um, no, actually. They keep waking me up in the morning, so <laughs> I'm going to have to get back at that. I'm going to start grinding at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> I had a big tractor trailer full of uh, big stones on it the other morning at about 7 in the morning, unloading with one of those beeping uh, forklifts. So, yeah, i got to get back at them somehow. So, so I have a question for you, Tosh. Sure. So what is your timeline for completing your 250, if you have one? So good question. Um, I generally don't do timelines anymore. Um, and ha saying that is because last year, for example, for me, with work, uh, my schedule is, uh, can be very busy. So for example, last year alone, I spent four months on the road. So it's pretty difficult to work on the A, you can, I can set a timeline in one week and the next week it'll be completely out the window. So I also find timelines to be uh, stressful um, if you're trying to meet some sort of goal. Um, but it can be fun to a degree, like when I set the D-minus uh, thing, that was kind of a goal to try to get it to British Car Day for its 50th. That just didn't work out. Um, but it was fun trying to make that point, but it's also to a degree stressful. So uh, I try not to set any timelines on my projects now. I have other cars to drive. So this car, as I say to people now, it'll get done when it gets done. But obviously, having said that, there are certain things that need to be done when I can do them. For example, painting. I've had to stall painting. You know, I can't paint a body tub in my garage in the dead of winter. It's just not going to happen. So I've got to sort of time things out that work as far as the season is concerned. So the next step on this car is really to get the body tub into paint. Once I get the body tub into paint, that allows me to move on to other areas of the car 
and not have to worry about having something to work on in the future when it gets co too cold to paint out here. So you really have to sort of, if working out of your garage, you really have to stage it so that the weather cooperates with you. Okay, good, good answer. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Um, so another question here from, um, from Clive. He says, Tush, Tush used to use POR15. No mention today, I think. Um, yeah, I can answer that. Hey, Clive. So um, POR15 is generally, I generally use on my frame. So uh, I did a full POR on my uh, TR6 project, which has held up extremely well. Um, I did a full POR um, bottom, uh, it's called white coat actually, on the bottom of my T TR3, and my whole bottom of my TR3 is done with port 15. So port 15 is, is really a choice. Uh, it's an expensive product to use. So depending on your budget, I can recommend the, the project, uh, the, the product. It is quite expensive to use. You really need to buy into the whole program. So you need to buy all three products and follow it extremely closely. So there's a, um, a degreaser that you need to buy. There's a metal prep that you need to buy. And then of course there's the pore 15 you need to buy. And on top of that, there's also a UV uh, top coat that you need to buy. So it's very expensive. So um, I'm not sure whether, I haven't got to the point where I've decided on the paint for my frame yet. Um, the cheapest route to do the frame is in something like a Rust-Oleum. And I've had good success using Rust-Oleum. It's the cheapest thing to do. So when I say Rust-Oleum, what I do is uh, I'll buy the cans of semi-gloss uh, Rust-Oleum. Let's see if I can find one in the, ca the cabinet over here real quick. So something like this. So this is... Yeah, we lost you, Tosh. Yeah. Till it's... It's that side of the garage again. Um, sorry, sorry. So <laughs> let me go back to the other side. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, if you want to go cheap, uh, Rust-Oleum with uh, a hardener added to it and a little bit of acetone to thin it and you can actually spray it. So it really depends on what you want to spend on your frame, expensive or cheap. So again, I haven't decided. I'll see how the funds go. <laughs> um, I'm currently not working. So uh, we'll, we'll see how the funds go and how the rest of the summer goes. But uh, I don't need to make that decision for probably a month or so. So we'll see. Okay. We have a follow-up on the bushings for the steering columns. To sure. It's about whether you need to pull the column out because they're not split, of course. No, you should be able to. It's easier to do them with the column out. There's a guy that makes a really nice, um, I think they're Nylatron bushings, a guy named Art Lip, who does a lot of nice uh, products. He makes a really nice uh, bushing kit for these cars, uh, including sort of a top bushing kit that really firms things up. So that I know for sure you can do with the column in, in situ. Um, the other bushings, I'd probably recommend taking the column out, unfortunately, which is a bit of a chore. And then we had a question about oil in the dash pots in the carbs and purpose. What do you use? Oh. And and, oh, and also, but yeah, I know. <laughs> you're trying to, you're, you're what trying you to get me in trouble? First of all, what do you use? Okay. So yeah, it's a big topic. When you talk engine oil or dash pot oil or trans oil, whatever, it's a big topic or bone yep. of contention on all of the forums. So what I do is I use uh, three in one oil, uh, which I believe is either 20 or 30 weight, depending on which one you get. And the reason I use three in one is because it seems to work for me, A, but B, I really like the little containers that it comes in. It comes with a little telescoping spout on it and it works perfectly to put oil in because you don't need much oil in your dash pots. So it works perfectly for adding oil to your dash pots and it's something I can just carry in the trunk in my little, uh, my little kit with me and uh, not have to worry about having oil to top up my dash pots if they're, if they're low. If your dash pots are lower, continuously low, then you have a problem with your O-rings in your uh, air valve. Okay, next question. Um, I was going to wait till the Zoom meeting on the mechanical night, if we have one. Is there an alternative to the clutch master and slave system? Yes. So you're t if he's talking about an upgrade in particular, um, so I've seen, uh, let's talk about uh, clutches first of all. So there are hydraulic clutches now uh, made by Good Parts, for example, makes a hydraulic throughout bearing. So that's an option for you. Um, as far as, are we talking brakes as well, Dave? Uh, just, just, men just mentioned clutch. So uh, yeah, so the hydraulic uh, throughout bearings, and obviously there are 
improved kits with like uh, larger uh, bearings, like the Koyo uh, bearing, for example, the throwout bearing um, that's, you know, provided in the, uh, the Magic Clutch kit. But if you're looking for a sort of a softer feel clutch, I think the hydraulic uh, uh, system sold by somebody like uh, Good Parts is probably the way to go. So there are definitely upgrades um, to your stock clutch systems. And obviously there's a bunch of, you know, uh, options as far as upgrading your complete trans to, and now you can buy a Mazda uh, conversion kit now. They're very, very expensive, but um, yeah. kits, kits like that are out there. Good, thank you. Uh, next question is also from Mike Ryanlander. Mike is a fairly new member at the Triumph Club. His next question is, what is the best way to jack up the car and put on the stands? That's a good question, actually. So I would say everybody knows about the Harbor Freight uh, jack stand recall. So if you have <laughs> Harbor Freight uh, jack stands, uh, I particularly like the, uh, the pinned jack stands. So this one here, I don't know if you'll be able to see this under the car or not, but you see how it has the pin in it? Yeah. So yep. the pin jack stands are better than the ratcheting style. Having said that, I still have the ratcheting style jack stands. So jacking a car up. So what I do, and again, this is just what I do. So you see up here, I've got these uh, rhino ramps. You see that okay? Mm -hmm. So those are 11,000 pound ramps. So the first thing I do when I'm jacking a car up and putting it up on. Go to the other side. <laughs> Sorry. A little bit lowered so it makes it easier for me to get a jack under the car first of all so and it, it helps uh, get the car up a little quick thing is i have here dusty but see a jacks here do is in a car and i try not to twist the car oh hang on Generally, I'll jack one side a little bit. I'll go around to the other. Hang on, Tush. You, you're, you're totally frozen. Am I back? You're yes. back now. Yep. You're back now. Yep. Yep. Okay, you're where did you leave me? Twisting. You're worried about twisting. Okay, so I've got the, uh, the two jacks on either side. So what I'll do is I'll go up a little bit on each side at a time because I don't like to twist the car if possible. The frames on these cars are a little flexible, as you know, you know, jacking the car up, you can see the body gaps change. So generally what I like to do is go back and forth and get, keep the car level as I'm jacking it up. I'll put the, uh, the stands under the rear of the car. And generally what I'll try to do is where I've got the stands now is generally where I kind of put the stands. You don't want to put the stands any further back where that starts to slope upwards. So generally I'll keep the stands up in this area up here, maybe even a little bit further forward, but that's generally where I'll put the rear stands. The fronts, uh, I like to jack up because I'm a big guy. I usually need more room than what the ramps can provide me. So what I'll do is I'll actually jack the front up more and I'll actually put jack stands under the front. And again, these are the ratchet style stands, but I'll generally put them in this area here towards the front of the car. I also, as a safety system, I'll leave the ramps there under the tires or under the car. Usually if I'm getting under the car to change the oil, I'll leave the tires on. So I'll leave the tires there with the ramps in but generally, I'll always have another set of stands in the middle of the car, just as safeties, and I'll always leave the jacks up just a little bit under the frame of the car in case for some reason the jack uh, or the, the stand fails, the jack will catch it. So I'm a little maybe overly paranoid about being under the car, but I don't want to be one of those guys that, uh, you know, spends his last minute struggling for a breath underneath of a car. <laughs> right. Do you ever Especially jack up when you're so close to finishing it, you know? Yeah. Do you ever jack up the rear at w both sides at once uh, under the, tr under the boot on the cross member? Yeah. Where the, like in the six where the bolt goes yeah. for the spare? Um, there, there are guys that do that or they'll actually jack up on the differential. There's actually, I think the better solution for that is to actually get, and I've actually seen, I think Harbor Freight sells them, an actual um, I-beam kit that goes cross that you can actually attach to your jack so it picks up both frame rails at the same time now technically you could probably do that with a two by six or whatever but that's probably the better case scenario is to do that as opposed to just jacking up on that that little bar on that little there's that little nut on the bottom there that you got to be kind of concerned with your jack falling off so yep. if you want to do that i would say run a two by six at the minimum across there or invest in you know a nice piece of steel or something and make your own lift out of it okay Got a question here from Rich S. Uh, Rich says, 
My six is currently sitting in a container on the last stage of its journey from England. Nice, when, nice. When it, when it finally arrives, I'll need to insure it. Do you have any recommendations for brokers? Well, I think I can jump in there for a second. Sure. Um, personally, I would say that Haggerty is probably one of the best ones. Um, they do a very good job of insuring many of our cars. They have some very good rates and they also pay out as well when there's an issue, if, if you do have an issue and you have to claim. That's my recommendation. Uh, Tush, Derek, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I have Haggerty on mine. It used to be um, Lant was the provider, now it's Haggerty. Yeah. And the good thing is that obviously they have an agreed value policy. So whatever your car is appraised for, uh, if you get in an accident and happen to write your car off, which would be unfortunate, at least you've got an agreed value policy. So to replace the value of the car that you have agreed to on the policy. You can also ask for a rider for a salvage. Uh, so you can actually, if it's written off, but still fixable, you can do both. You can write it off, get the amount, and then actually salvage the car yourself, and they don't, uh, they allow you to take, buy it back. Now, obviously, there are limitations on uh, policies like that if you're not aware. Um, things like, you know, not being able to use it as a commuting vehicle, not being able to drive it to work. Um, I think in some cases for Haggerty now, you have to have a locked garage or a locked unit to be able to put the car in. You cannot leave it outside. So there are certain things that you need to do in order to be insured by Haggerty or be covered by Haggerty. As far as the, uh, now, the driving is concerned, uh, throw a wrench in the car and say you're tuning it or something like that. To, you know, if you get, happen to get stopped or happen to get in a little fender bender, there are restrictions. Uh, be careful. You definitely want to be covered if you do happen to take it grocery shopping and get dinged in a parking lot. Good. Thank you. Uh, another question. Oh, question here from Wayne. Wayne says, uh, do you prefer body color or black for the rocker panels? Originally, I believe, try it for use an asphalt based material. What do you suggest today? Lost Dave. Hello. Oh, no, he's... Can you hear me, Tush? No, we've lost I him. can hear you, Dave. Yeah, I can hear you, Dave. I think it's just Tush that's uh, frozen again. So uh, now I missed Dave's question, no. Oh, oh, okay. okay, so let me try again. Can you hear me now? I guess not. I can, so. Yeah, oh. come on Trish, come on back. Come on back Trish. I'm back. Okay, can you hear me now? Anybody see me yet? No, no, I can hear you. We can hear you. Where have you gone to? Yeah, I don't see him. No, I don't see him. I'm, I, can, I can hear you guys. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, there we there go. You go. You're back. back. You're back yeah, now. Yeah, moved. Yeah, okay. we lost you and got, he came back. Okay, so here's the, here's the question from Wayne. Wayne yeah. says, do you prefer body color or black for the rocker panels? Originally, I believe Triumph used an asphalt paste material. What do you suggest today? So the, I believe the original was a 3M product called Schutz and it was black. And Wayne would know better than me since he's uh, an original owner. So for me, my preference is black on the rockers. And I actually like personally, and this is again a personal, you know, I like black in the wheel wells. What material? So um, actually on my TR6, if you can believe it, I actually used Duplicolor truck bed liner. So I used a spray can of Duplicolor truck bed liner, which actually mimicked the look of the 3M Schutz pretty well. It didn't have a really coarse texture. It just had a right texture to it and a right color. It wasn't too shiny, too matte. It just seemed to work out really well. So I'll probably end up doing that again on this uh, TR250 project. And it's held up really well and it's quite washable. Uh, I think the 3M Schutz, it gets a little gray and a little chalky and it gets a little harder to wash. I haven't had that issue on my Duplicolor truck bed liner. Okay, good, thank you. And I've got a question here from Mark Punga. Uh, he says, my TR6, my 76 TR6 has excessive steering wheel play. Tie rods, tie rod ends, ball joints, etc., all good. Is there a way to adjust the steering box to tighten things up? Any other possible things to check out? Thank you. The, the first thing I, or the, the first couple of things I would check would probably be that rubber uh, coupling. I don't have a steering mechanism in this car, but obviously there's a rubber coupling 
that attaches your upper shaft to your lower shaft. That's the first thing I would be looking at because those are made of rubber and they can degrade over time. So that's the very first thing I would look at. Second thing I'd look at is I'd also look at the universal down below where it connects to the actual um, steering rack. I check to make sure that universal is nice and tight and is lubed properly and moves freely. So those are the first two things I would probably look at. And then the final question is, yes, the steering rack can be um, adjusted. There's a preload setting. Um, I'm not a steering rack professional, but yes, it can be adjusted. They can be rebuilt. Um, my TR6 one I had actually professionally rebuilt. Um, so that's not something I've tackled personally. Generally, things that are critical like steering or hubs, for example, I've yet to sort of delve in. I actually will farm things out that I'm not comfortable doing that are critical to the operation of the car, like the hubs. If you get the hubs wrong, you don't get the, the bearing end float set on the hubs and you lose a wheel uh, on the 400 or the 401 or whatever. And I drive my cars fairly long distances. You know, my last trip was to St. Louis in the TR6. It's not something you want to happen at uh, 75 miles an hour on the 407. Okay, good enough. Thank you very much, Tush. Yeah. I, I think we're out of questions now. So as it's coming up to 8.15, um, I'm ready for my supper. I suspect some other people are as well. So Tush, I want to thank you very much for joining us tonight and all of the fantastic information you have and uh, to share with us what you're doing with the TR250 and of course, all your other TRs as well. So thank you. Now we have recorded the meeting. I have no idea how we actually get that to the rest of our members, but we'll figure that out, hopefully. And uh, with Derek's help, I'm sure. So uh, again, Tush, Thank you. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us. We had about 39 people joining the call. And um, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Thank Thanks, you Dave. all. Thank you all. Good night.